but one. Thank you. You may be seated. Good exercise. And in the heat, even better. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're in chapter 18. The message tonight entitled, Making the Jews Jealous. Acts chapter 18. I hope you had a good afternoon of rest. We're back ready to look at what may happen here in the United States. That's what's going on here in the text tonight as we look at making the Jews jealous. Acts chapter 18, we'll be looking at verses 13, uh, 12 and 13 tonight, but we're going to start by reading back from verse 5. It helps us to understand our context. Acts chapter 18, I'll start reading in verse 5. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Before we read those next two verses, let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you are always with us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. That's the promise of Jesus himself. And Father, how we thank you for your mercy and grace that you are still calling out from this filthy world those who are your elect, irresistibly drawing them to Christ and causing them to live lives of holiness and wisdom and purity, righteousness in the midst of an ungodly culture. Father, help us to be courageous and do the same. Help us to be men and women of God who are unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, even if persecution should arise, as we see happening here in our text tonight. Father, we thank you that you are a good and gracious God, a God who is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Father, we pray for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You recall as we were looking at these preceding verses here, where the Apostle Paul is presenting the gospel at Corinth to the Jews. He's, he, he's done some very careful reasoning to get him to this point. But when Silas and Timothy arrive, he feels, I've got to be more blunt. And so he is. And we reached what we called two weeks ago a tipping point. There, this was the point where, as Paul was going through his missionary journeys, he always went first to the Jewish synagogue. He already had a base established there, people who already knew something about the Old Testament, people who would already understand that there were prophecies concerning a coming Messiah, and he would start there. But we find a tipping point at Corinth with a particular church, a particular group of people, particular opponents to the gospel, where Paul says, from now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. And of course, that's what the book of Acts is all about, is the expansion of the gospel, moving first from Jewish males in Acts chapter 2 to those who are both men and women when we get to Acts chapter 8 and half-breeds, half-Jewish, half-Gentiles with the Samaritans. And then we find the gospel moving to Gentiles in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius and his household, but a Jewish apostle, the apostle to the Jews, Peter being the one who brings them in. And then as we move through the rest of the book of Acts, we see the expansion of the gospels to all of these peoples in that Hellenized world 
who were trusting in Christ from many different groups. Now the Apostle Paul is at Corinth, a place where there's a great deal of immorality, a great place of, of horrible wickedness and sin and pagan idolatry and sports and sex and all the other things that we talked about in preceding weeks. He was at Corinth. That was the most perverted sex capital of the Greek-speaking world, located, as we talked about last week, on the Isthmus of Corinth, where ships not only landed, but where most of the ships traveling west were dragged overland from the Aegean Sea on the east side to the Gulf of Corinth on the west side, which emptied into the Ionian Sea in the southern part of the Adriatic Sea. Both of those two bodies of land, which were joined together by that narrow strip of land, are Greece, Upper Mass, called Macedonia, the lower, smaller body of land, the province of Achaia. It's called by its descriptive name in historical literature as the Peloponnesus. Forty miles west of Athens, across the water, or slightly longer if you take the land route. There were two separate seaports. One of those two seaports, as well as Corinth, is mentioned in the New Testament, Sencrea. It's on the Aegean Sea as a suburb of Corinth. Lycaeum was on the edge of the Gulf of Corinth on the, re on the west. We saw some other interesting connections in history. The, the Romans destroyed Corinth in 146 BC, but because of its importance, Julius Caesar later rebuilt it. By the time Paul arrived in the city and spent 18 months there, from 50 to 52, and we'll see again how we can date that tonight because of Gallio, who is mentioned in our text, that city had grown to a population of half a million people. That was very large for the ancient world. It was the ideal crossroads and the only crossroads by land from north to south. It was the best east-west crossroads for ships coming by sea because when they would land there, they would drag the ships across the isthmus from one side to the other. It was a wealthy resort city, similar to Las Vegas. People came there to spend their time, their pleasures, and their monies. It was a city that worshipped sex and pleasure. The god goddess of the city was Aphrodite, the goddess of erotic love. We saw that the stadium was second only to the stadium at Olympus where the Greek Olympics were held. At Corinth, the competition drew crowds from all over the ancient Greek world and was held every two years at the Ionian uh, Stadium. We talked about why they dragged the boats overland. It shortened the sailing time by several days. They shortened the travel distance by 202 miles. It meant the ships did not have to sail through the more dangerous waters of the Mediterranean Sea and avoided the dangerous waters of the Cyclades. It also avoided Sparta at the tip of the Peloponnesus and the sea lanes between Sparta and Athens, which, as we talked about in times of war, could be very dangerous. And we talked about the Peloponnesian War, which lasted 27 years from 431 to 404 BC. We talked about Thucydides of Athens, who was the one who recorded historically for us what went on at that period of time. We saw that the fifth reason they dragged the boats over land at Corinth was at a more direct route to and from Rome and to and from the east than taking the land routes. We saw that that narrow neck of water off the Ionian Sea, called the Gulf of Corinth, was 80 miles long and between 3 and 20 miles wide and protected the ships from the great storms on the sea. But I don't think I mentioned last week, as we were talking about this, that today ships still go across this point, but they don't drag them. They go through a canal that has been dug there. The person who began digging the Corinthian Canal, and he's going to tie in with our uh, discussion this evening as we see this man by the name of Gallio, the guy who actually started digging that Corinthian Canal in 67 AD was Nero. He used slave labor, including Jewish captives, to begin the digging of that canal. He didn't complete it, but the project was undertaken again once again in 1891 and was actually completed in 1893. The western entrance is about 1.5 miles northeast of New Corinth. It's 69 feet wide at the bottom, so it's not real wide. It's 26 feet deep from the surface of the water to the bottom, and it's 3.9 miles long. That's how narrow the isthmus is. It's 3.9 miles, not quite four miles across that isthmus. But they used to drag ships four miles. Can you imagine that? Think about dragging some huge wooden boat on rolling logs all the way across that isthmus for four miles. That shortens the journey from the Adriatic to Piraeus by 202 miles for any ship small enough to navigate it. And 
You know, as I was thinking about that, I thought, I've been there. I was. I was there and I saw it. I went to Corinth on my honeymoon with Judy. We had a wonderful time, went to Israel, went to um, Greece, took a five-day cruise on the Aegean Sea on a Greek ocean liner. Incredible time. Brought back lots of wonderful memories as I was thinking about that. But uh, actually, I was in Corinth and gave my greetings to an evangelical church on behalf of my father. My dad was supposed to have gone on that trip. I don't think I've told you this before, but that honeymoon, I was actually leading a tour to Israel. It was a tour my dad was supposed to leave, but lead, but he, he came down sick right before the tour, and so I ended up getting his ticket. You could do that back in those days. And we bought a ticket for Judy with the money that came in for our wedding. We had exactly enough to buy the ticket and to be able to go on that honeymoon like a week and a half after we got married. <laughs> Things are a little changed from what they were back then. Our passports were still good. We'd just gotten back from Israel the year before. And so uh, that was a fantastic honeymoon. God worked it out by letting my dad get sick, and I led that tour instead. Let me add one other odd point of trivia that may be of interest to you at this point. While reading an article in the Encyclopedia Britannica and preparing this message, I discovered a very interesting little fact. All of you are probably familiar with a little fruit called currants. Did you know that this has historically been one of the main, main exports of Corinth, and that is where the fruit gets its name? Currants comes from Corinth. I thought, that is cool. Well, anyway, tonight, the first thing that we noticed was that God gave Paul some key morally upright and pure leadership for the new church at Corinth. He was a church planning missionary, you remember. He needed some morally pure, well-grounded men to fill positions of leadership when God called him to move on. As we see from the first epistle to the Corinthians, the kind of people that got saved at Corinth had a very ugly, sexually immoral, sordid background and they had all kinds of very wicked practices. So God in his mercy had the very most important key Jewish leader in the synagogue be the principal convert to Paul's message, even when the rest of that synagogue had reached the tipping point and emphatically rejected the gospel. We talked about that last week. Tipping point of even one person can result in the damnation for an entire family, an entire church, an entire city, an entire nation and the carrying of the gospel somewhere else. The Corinthian synagogue didn't realize that, but it was at the point that the gospel would go principally to the Gentiles and they'd be left groveling in the dust of their own self-righteous wealth. We noticed something else last week. You recall that it emphasized very strongly here, multiple times, that not only was Crispus saved, but his entire household. And that was the promise that had been given back in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, in relation to the Philippian jailer. He had asked, what, Sirs, what must I do to be saved in verse 30? And it said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And verse 32, And to all that were in his house. Verse 33, And was baptized he in all his straightway. Verse 34, Believing in God with all his house. God is beginning to expand, as we saw in contrast, four times it emphasized it there in 1 Corinthians 15, and we see it again here in our Acts chapter 18 passage, where an entire family is saved, not merely one individual out of that family. The Old Testament narrowed who would be saved and who would be blessed. We started off with Adam and Eve having multiple children, but God selected the line of Seth. They multiplied again and filled the earth, and then God selected Noah and his family. He narrows it down. After the flood, they multiplied again and built the Tower of Babel, so God narrowed the line to Shem. They continued in wickedness, so God narrowed the line to Abraham, then to Isaac, then and he did that over Ishmael, and then to the twelve tribes of Judah, then to David, then to Nathan, then to Boaz and Ruth, and he kept narrowing it till he reached Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. But after Pentecost we see the reverse of that process. We see the expansion of the gospel. We see entire families getting saved. We see it going not merely from Jews, not merely to Samaritans, not merely to those who are Jewish by religion and Gentile by birth, like the Ethiopian eunuch and neither male nor female. We see it going to the entire world. We saw that promise was repeated to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 13 and 14, where a promise is made where even one member of a couple who is saved, they have promises concerning their children. God is expanding the gospel and reaching the world, not merely through individuals, but reaching the world through families. And that is really important because, of course, we are God's family. 
God's teaching some very practical lessons as he reaches those who are lost and in the worst possible pagan cultures. Corinth, we saw, was very, very similar to the United States, focused on sex and sports. But God was reaching a huge group of people there at Corinth. I have much people in this city, and God has much people here in the United States. They need to hear the gospel. You and I have been placed in this place at a very critical point, a very critical juncture in history to reach this country with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw that because Corinth was the way it was, that's why moral purity is so important because it not only affects us and our children, but moral purity also affects the type of impact that we'll make on our society and the type of leadership that we'll be able to give to those who come to Christ out of that kind of a culture. That's why the message last week was entitled, Where to Look for Converts, or The Bottom of the Barrel. Christ came into the world to save sinners, and Paul understood, because he had deep spiritual insight, that he felt himself to be the chief of sinners. We saw God gave Paul some encouragement. I'm with thee, no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Paul had been badly stoned, beaten, persecuted in many other cities where he'd been doing his missionary work, and so God gave him encouragement. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And we saw that very much that same message is reflected in Paul's epistle to the Hebrews in chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Same thing he said to Paul in that night vision, for I will be with thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Don't be afraid. Nobody's going to sit on you to hurt you. That's exactly the same message, and it's repeated to the Hebrews who are about to go under, undergo persecution with the destruction of the city of Jerusalem when the epistle to the Hebrews was written. Notice that statement is said in the context of the verse 4 we saw before, which deals with one of the principal problems at Corinth, which was sexual immorality, which is, by the way, a major attack in every church. It's rampant in churches all across the United States today. So remember that judgment is coming. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. And then he goes into that wonderful promise that was also given at Corinth as he speaks to the Hebrews. We saw where God chose his elect out of that city of wickedness. We saw that God chose both the chief Jew and the chief Gentile in that city. The chief Jew, Crispus, and the chief Gentile, Gaius, as we read Romans chapter 16:23. Several other important Corinthians were also mentioned in that passage, not just that one family, not just the chief Gentile, but we also saw that it was written, Romans was written from Corinth, sent by Phoebe unto the church of Sancria, which we mentioned earlier in the message, and that also Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, salutes you. Erastus was the city treasurer, a rather important position at any time of history. So that brings us to our text for tonight. When Gallio was deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. He's been making the Jews jealous. They don't like what they see going on. I'm sure, as we talked about last week, they didn't like the fact that this was the rubble of Corinth that was coming into the house right next door to the synagogue. And Paul was preaching, no doubt loud enough, to be heard through the walls. But they made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. We have a bunch of lessons that we can learn from this passage. Lesson number one. New leadership can always expect to inherit problems of former leadership. You know, I saw that when I came here. You wouldn't believe how many people, some of whom are no longer here, because I wouldn't respond to their types of accusations, that immediately want to reach out to you and tell you how bad things were before and then tell you why those things were so bad and that you'd better not do those same things. I had some folks like that here when I first came to this church. I had that kind of thing happen to me when I went to the church in North Jersey years and years and years and years ago. I'd only had three years of ministry at that point as an assistant to my dad, and I came up there as a senior pastor, and within the first week, I got a phone call that said, I'd like to tell you about Pastor So-and-So, 
Several people had already told me about a former pastor who'd been involved in adultery, had moved to another church, and then had seduced the, the wife of the chief deacon of that other church. Oh, people love to spread gossip. I won't put up with that. I said, who is this, please? They said, oh, that's not important. I said, well, then it's not important to hear what you have to say. And I hung up on them. Same kind of thing is happening here in our text tonight. New leadership can always expect to inherit problems of former leadership. Gallio has just become the deputy, the Roman proconsul, of Achaia. This affected people who have not had their way since that a new leader who doesn't yet know all the facts might be more open to hearing their cause. And there are at least three reasons for that, or four. Number one, as they bring their petition, they're trying to gain favor and prove themselves to be a very vocal group of people. And you always want, if you're a leader, or at least a compromising leader, you always want to gain favor with that very vocal group of people. Number two, he might be more open to hearing their cause to avoid trouble as he's trying to get his feet on the ground. Man, I don't want any trouble here. I got, I got to figure out the, the landscape first. That, you know, I got to make sure that we don't have some kind of a, a riot and the place blows apart and everybody says, it's your fault. You know, that's what happens every time there's a presidential election and, and, and there have been accusations going on all through the, the campaign and finally the guy gets into office and even though something might have been building up under the former administration, if it then breaks loose and goes wrong in his administration, he gets blamed for it. Hey, folks, that happens in churches, too. That happens between churches and the societies in which they live, where the Christians get blamed for the problems, like Nero blamed the Christians for the fire in Rome. We're going to talk more about Nero tonight, Lord willing, a little bit later in the message, because he actually plays a very important part even at this point. And we'll see that, the Lord willing, in a few minutes. He's a kid at this point. Number three, the new leadership needs to be very careful as he hears these cases brought by vocal people because they sense that that new leader may have possibly some sympathies with their political or religious positions which were not held by the former leader. And number four, the leader doesn't yet know the character or power of the group that's screaming and yelling. You know, people can be loud, but you don't really know where they're coming from. Four very important principles that you learn here as you enter this passage and as you see the Jews with one accord, they're organized, they got their act together, they make insurrection, it looks like a riot is going to happen, the new leader certainly doesn't want a riot in the city. In that passage, the Jews are screaming and yelling to curtail the religious freedom of Paul and the Christians at Corinth. Have you ever thought that that might be actually going on today? There are people who are screaming and yelling to try to curtail the religious freedom of the Christians. You know there is. The group that has come before the Supreme Court of the United States. Today, that group has at last gained access to the Supreme Court in their attack against marriage. They're now demanding their rights, so-called, that will curtail the freedom of Christians to worship. Did you get that was what was going on here in this passage? They said, this fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. Hey, you know, the Sodomite movement doesn't care if you worship God whatever that happens to be defined as, just so long as it's a God who doesn't call their activity sin. Paul was persuading people to worship God, in their accusation anyway, contrary to the law. You know, people don't understand how that could possibly happen here in the United States. Lord willing, I'm going to be including a bulletin insert in the bulletin next week, which is a legal update from one of my good lawyer friends, A. Eric Johnson Esquire, who is the president of the Southeast Law Institute. I started working with Eric many years ago when I was still in law school and still keep in touch with him to this day. Eric, most recently, was one of the principal attorneys involved in the Alabama Policy Institute's case, where I served as the general counsel for eight and a half years, 
challenging the federal judge who mandated that all the Alabama probate judges must issue same-sex marriage licenses. Eric was one of the lead attorneys in bringing the case of Alabama Policy Institute and several other public policy groups in Alabama up for petition before the Supreme Court of Alabama. But people don't understand how that's going to affect religious freedom. I'd like to read you some parts here of this educational update that explains it, even though I'm going to be including this in next week's bulletin, but it, it fits perfectly with what goes on in our text tonight. By the way, as I'm reading through this, I want you to notice something. Notice the legal precedent, because Eric tracks the legal precedent and the decisions that have been made by the U.S. Supreme Court, the reasoning that the U.S. Supreme Court has used from what seems like a very innocent kind of a beginning up to where those same arguments are now being used by the homosexuals to try to persuade the court that they must keep stare decisis, they must, must keep the status quo, that they have to continue to use the same legal principles that they used all the way back into the 60s and before. They can't change the way they do law. And so if they can't change the way they do law, then therefore they must grant these rights to the homosexuals. So note the legal precedent that paved the way for the sodomite movement, and it goes all the way back to the issue of contraceptives and birth control, which was one of the things that I mentioned this morning was one of the daggers that Satan has used to attack motherhood. Let me read you this update. The issue of gay marriage is not the end of an odd legal odyssey. The legal precedent accepting around gay, uh, excuse me, accreting around gay rights will culminate in the destruction of the Judeo-Christian culture. During the last part of the 20th century, many conservative and Christian commentators began to worry about the secularization of the culture and the diminution of traditional values. To look at gay rights now as just another evidence of the challenge to the culture is a mistake. Instead, it is a turning point in the secularization of the culture. It's amazing how what's been going on around us has been matching the series of sermons and acts. We talked about a tipping point. Here we have a tipping point in the culture. I hadn't read Eric's stuff before I wrote that message about tipping point. This just came to me. The weapon used for this victory is sex. It's not merely a purient interest in sex, but sexual freedom as the legal basis for freeing us from cultural constraints, the right to engage in immorality as a protected constitutional right, now here's key words, without criticism. This right is now being used to destroy moral boundaries, including the family. We talked about that this morning, didn't we? with motherhood. It all began, innocently enough, with the case of Griswold versus Connecticut. That's a, a law case that every student in constitutional law studies going through law school today. That's 381 U.S. 479, done in 1965, middle 60s. We talked about the sexual revolution in the 60s. The U.S. Supreme Court struck down a state law which prohibited sale of contraceptives to married couples. For the first time, the court found a constitutional, quote, right to privacy protecting sexual rights. Who could have imagined in 1965 that the so-called right to privacy would be turned on its head to mandate a recognition of sodomite so-called marriages? Then in Eisenstadt versus Baird, 405 U.S. 483, 1972, the court applied the rationale to unmarried persons. Before they said you can't sell contraceptives, the state did, said you can't sell contraceptives to married couples. Then in 1972, it says, well, you can't prohibit them from selling contraceptives to unmarried couples. While we may have been concerned with the Supreme Court's creating unenumerated protected constitutional rights, that is, finding rights in the Constitution that heretofore had not ever been found, none were prescient in predicting this rationale would lead to the recognition of... Huh, here it is. Second thing that we mentioned this morning, the so-called right to abortion 
in Roe v. Wade, 410 U.S. 113 in 1973. Then in Kerry v. Population Services International, 431 U.S. 678, also 1977, using the same rationale, the court struck down a state law prohibiting the sale of contraceptives to children, that is, persons under 16. One of the states that says you can't sell contraceptives to kids 16 years old and under. The U.S. Supreme Court struck that down on this basis of the so-called emanations of the penumbras of the Constitution. You see how things are falling one right after? You make one wrong decision. Folks, you've heard me preach this over and over, that every decision you make, if you are consistent, will affect every other decision that you make after that. When you make one theological premise, it's going to affect all the rest of your theology. The same thing is true in your practical lives. Now states can no longer prohibit the sale of contraceptives to children. Moving rapidly forward, these cases and their rationale, remember there's the same rationale that started back there in Griswold versus Connecticut, were cited in Lawrence v. Texas. I hope you know the name of that case. That was one of the tipping points. 539 U.S. 558 in 2003, when the United States Supreme Court struck down a Texas criminal sodomy law. Texas used to have a law saying that sodomy, consensual sodomy, was a criminal offense and you could be punished with criminal penalties. U.S. Supreme Court struck that down in 2003. We're moving up to the present, aren't we, folks? Then the U.S. Supreme Court in United States versus Windsor, that was in 2013, just two years ago, struck down the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, which was a congressionally passed act recognizing one man and one woman is what forms a marriage. The court relied on Lawrence, that's that anti-sodomy law that was in Texas that the court struck down, saying, quote, private consensual sexual intimacy between two adult persons of the same sex may not be punished by the state, and it can, quote, form but one element in a personal bond that is more enduring. How much sewage do we have to listen to from our courts? A personal bond that is more enduring. Oh, it reaches my heart. That's in a U.S. Supreme Court decision from 2013. What began as simple recognition of a married couple's right to contraceptives has resulted in a complete recognition of sexual freedom. Conventional wisdom is that in June 2015, in the case of Obergfell versus Hodges, that's the sodomy case that's just been heard, the U.S. Supreme Court will strike down all state traditional one-man, one-woman marriage laws. But that's not the final goal of this odyssey. While adoption, inheritance, spousal rights, and other laws will be rewritten, that's still not the end of the odyssey. The final destination is the required acceptance of all things perverse to establish moral order. This right of privacy, or quote, sexual liberty, as the Lawrence Court called it, results in the destruction of the family. It also results in the destruction of religious freedom. Our culture is based on the government, the family, and the church. As with any three-legged stool, and you've heard me use that illustration many times on many other things, you remove one of the supports and the stool falls over. What began as protected intimacy in the marital context has now resulted in the attack on the family, which, as we will soon see, is an attack on the church. The government is being used to redefine the family. The redefinition of family requires that the church abandon its scriptural and historic condemnation of sodomy and other perverse forms of sexual activity. While the same-sex issue is important, we must not let it distract us from recognizing the final objective of this assault. The church, that is all religion, must be removed as the righteous force for good. We saw that already take place in 
one country in our lifetimes. I think most of you are old enough to remember Nazi Germany, where the church was silenced. The church was Nazified in Germany, and those pastors like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who spoke out, were either put in prison or ultimately, as Bonhoeffer was, just days before the end of the war, was hung to death. The most significant evidence of this now is the opposition to state statutes protecting religious freedom in the form of religious freedom restoration laws. The sodomites are going after the religious freedom restoration laws. We'd had one that was national. The court said, no, that's a matter for states' rights. They need to say the same thing about all these other perversion things, too. But no, no, we, we, we're not going to uphold the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of the United States government. It goes to the states. But now those are under attack. Most recent example of this attack is on the state of Indiana for passing such a law. And the governor signed the law into effect to protect the businesses of that state from the attacks of sodomites. And he was screamed down. And he backed up in his position. Governor Pence. This is a very vocal and very vicious group, just like the group we see in our text tonight. They're claiming that the Christians are teaching things that are contrary to the law. And they're screaming and yelling about it and cutting and slashing their way to the top. Folks, that's what's going on in our text tonight. Put yourself back there with Paul at Corinth. They dragged him to the Bema, to the judgment seat. They dragged him before the number one leader in that entire region, the proconsul of Rome. Do you understand this has been happening all across our country? Well, the media doesn't report much on it. But there are dozens of cases right now where Christians have been crushed because they have taken a stand for their own religious freedom and said that because they believe that sodomy is sin, they will not participate in sodomite celebrations. It was okay if, if you don't believe that sodomy is sin up to this point. If you believe that sodomy is sin, it, it, you know, it's okay. As long as it doesn't get outside the walls of your church. It's going to come inside the walls of the church. They're going to start persecuting inside the church. Right now, what they're doing is they're hitting individual Christians who have businesses like making cakes. I told you about that couple out in Oregon that they refused to bake a lesbian wedding cake, and as a result, they got fined $135,000 by the judge who said they were discriminating because they didn't want to participate in a lesbian celebration of, quote, marriage. A wedding chapel in Nevada, where the minister performs weddings, but it's not a church, it's, it's a wedding chapel, and he refused to do a homosexual wedding and got sued and dragged into court. Hey, folks, it doesn't matter what you call it, that's going to eventually reach the church. People like Arlene's flowers that didn't want to make wedding flowers. She'd make flowers for any other occasion, but not wedding flowers for a sodomite marriage. Got dragged into court. Bar Baronella Stutzman. You see, the attack is the Christians are teaching religion that is contrary to the law. That's what was going on here in our text tonight. It's obvious the opposition by the gay lobby to pass, passing these laws is not merely for the purpose of permitting same-sex marriage. That may happen anyway and without regard to religious freedom laws. The purpose of their opposition is to require everyone, even the church, to accept homosexuality in all of its forms and activities and to condone it. 
He goes on, and I won't read you all the rest of this. He's got another whole page of this on legal size paper where he's tracking various cases, the Employment Division versus Smith, which was a very badly decided court case. It's actually a, a case that deals with illegal drug use, but it was used in an Indian religious ceremony that used peyote in the Indian religious ceremony. It set some very interesting legal precedent, the principles of which are now being used by the sodomites to say you can't have religious freedom laws in the states. Not only can't you have them in the federal government, you can't have them in the states either. One that came out of Texas, I'm not going to read you all about it, but the city of Bernie versus Flores. Bernie was just about 30 miles from where I used to live. Bernie's where one of my very close friends currently lives. Various types of tests that were being used are now being used against the church. Well, I'll jump down to the very bottom of this. You know about the Burwell versus Hobby Lobby, which was just last year, 2014. There, the Obama administration sought to enforce the provision of abortifacients, but the U.S. Supreme Court, relying on the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, protected them. Pray that the court will find that kind of reasoning in this most recent sodomite case. Obviously, this is creating a legal and moral upheaval in our culture. The legalization of homosexuality and all its attributes upends the moral order. Even so, those who hold sincerely held religious beliefs must be protected. But that is the problem, and the gay activists object to it, and they objected to Indiana's law in the same way, as well as to other efforts that may be made to protect religious liberty. On the other hand, protecting religious liberty protects the culture, the family, and the church. If we do not protect these religious rights, our culture is destroyed simply because of sex. Folks, that's what we have going on here in our text tonight. The Christians are being accused of violating the law. You know, if the sodomites can get their way, they'll force Christian schools to accept sodomite teachers. If they can get their way, they can force Christian ministries to accept sodomite representatives for their ministries. They can force Christian churches to participate in their so-called wedding ceremonies. Right now, they're forcing Christian businesses that want nothing to do with celebrating the gay lifestyle either to participate or being fined with outrageous fines and being closed down. That's why we need to pray for our leaders. Gallio in our text tonight was Junius Gallio, originally named Lucius Aeneas Novatus. Now listen to this, very interesting. He was the elder brother of Lucius Aeneas Seneca. How many of you have heard of Seneca? Yeah, I guess so. We've all heard of Seneca, haven't we? This was the older brother of Seneca. He was actually a Spaniard. He was born at Cordoba, Spain, sometime during the lifetime of Jesus. He died in 65 AD. Although he went through a period of banishment, he returned to Rome when Agrippina... <laughs> Listen, here was the tie-in with Nero. Remember, we talked about Nero a little earlier here. Persecution of Christians. He returned to Rome when Agrippina selected Seneca to be the tutor of Nero. So I think he's rather significant in history, this man who's showing up here in the pages of Acts chapter 18. He gives us a fascinating connection to the later persecution of the Christians under Nero, although he himself refused to persecute them in our text tonight. But his brother taught Nero. And you know the persecution that Nero brought. He's a good historical marker. We mentioned that a moment ago for the date of our text this evening because he was the Roman proconsul of Achaia during the period from 51 to 52 AD. So we know exactly when this is taking place at Corinth. Notice the charges brought. They accuse the Christians of violating the law. Of course, that's, as we said, what the Sodomites are doing today. So pray that the Supreme Court will respond like Gallio did. The Jews didn't know what to expect from him. He was new. 
The Jews, however, had a very united front that had been building for a year and a half. And they had their act together when they attacked. And the Sodomites, when this first started all this movement, weren't very organized, but today they are highly organized. Where when they see anybody raising his head in any political sphere that might possibly stand against their movement, they come out full force and attack. It's not going to stop with politics, folks. I expect it to end up here at Bible Presbyterian Church at some point in the near future. They had their legal arguments together. They claimed Christians were opposing the state. Remember that. Christians are opposing the state. Why do you think there's persecution going on in China today? Because the Christians are accused of opposing the state. Government can't tolerate any kind of interference or meddling with what it's doing. Same with Hitler. Same in communist Russia where the Christians had to meet out in the forests and in hiding because Christianity was seen in opposition to the state. No Christian churches anywhere in any Muslim countries because the churches are in opposition to the state. Men are going to have a God of some sort, some place, somewhere, some way. And they have a choice between the God of the universe or a local, local trivial pagan God like the 330 million gods that are worshipped by the Hindus. Or when there's a powerful man or group of men in control, the state becomes God. People, that's the way we're moving here in the United States today. Interesting. They claim the Christians were opposing the state in violation of secular law, but they found out that Gallio was hard-nosed and he would not have anything to do with restricting the religious freedom of the Christians. Pray that our Supreme Court will see it that way as well. Unfortunately, Nero did not follow the same pattern. Now, let me just pause for a minute and tell you something that's coming down the road. Right after this series that we're doing with Ray Vanderlan, which only has, I think, two more weeks, maybe three more weeks, two more weeks in it, we're going to be doing a series just recently put out by the Institute for Creation Research. Twelve-part series, fascinating series, brand new, up-to-date, all the latest scientific information, including the information about finding dinosaur bones with red blood cells still in them. That doesn't last for. 165 million years, back to the Jurassic period, so-called. I hope you can come on Wednesday evenings. But immediately after that, we're going to be seeing a series on the early church. Because I think it ties in very well with what's going on in our culture today. Going back to the various historic sites also. But throughout the ancient Roman world, the ancient Hellenized Roman world, where Christians were accused of all kinds of things against the state. I encourage you to be here for that. Fourteen weeks from now, we'll see all the horrendous accusations that the pagans and the Jews brought against the Christians that fueled many of the persecutions, including that persecution under Nero, where he claimed they burned Rome. But you know, Christians were accused of being anti-patriotic. Did you know that might happen here? Did you know that right now in the U.S. military, chaplains are being drummed out of the military corps because they have counseled men not to be involved in homosexual activity? They're anti-patriotic, you see. Folks, that's coming here. Early church was accused of being anti-patriotic. The early church was accused of cannibalism. Now, is that bizarre or is that bizarre? The early church was accused of incest. Hey, that's breaking state law. Christians are thrown into prison for that, even though it wasn't true. Come and see that series. But just remember this, the point of our text tonight and the point of all these things that I've just been telling you is do not expect unregenerates to play fair.
if you haven't caught on by now through the many years of life that most of you have had, unregenerates don't play fair. They're not under the same rules that you and I are under, where we have to base everything we do on the truth, where we have to base everything that we do to the glory of God. Unregenerates don't play fair. They cheat. Pray that our Supreme Court will respond in the same manner that Gallio did here. Here, Gallio clearly understood the difference between criminal law and religious activity. Pray that our Supreme Court will make it as clear as Gallio did. With one accord, they made insurrection against Paul, claimed that he broke the law. Oh, it's going to be great seeing what Gallio does next week. I'm not going to, not going to preach next week's sermon yet. But pray that our Supreme Court might respond the same way that Gallio did when he drave them from his judgment seat. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word, for its power, for its historical context, for its applicability to us here in the United States today. Father, your word is teaching us lessons. This is not merely so that we can have a Sunday school lesson to tell kids about how Paul didn't get persecuted at this point. It's designed to teach us the way that you work in history and the way that Satan has worked against you in history and what we can expect, how to respond to it, and how you are the one who ultimately will win the victory. Father, we thank you for your word and for its power and for its application today. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is number 225. Let's sing something joyful.